I am Jimbo Paris, and you are listening to the Jimbo Paris Show. Hello, everyone. This is Jimbo Paris. Welcome again to the Jimbo Paris Show. Today we have Matthew, and Matthew is a keynote speaker and medical device sales expert. So. This is super cool stuff. Again, I'm a, a John Hopkins student, so uh, anything medical really just fascinates me. So let's just see what he has to say. I want to learn more about a lot of these so-called devices that he works with. So how's it going, man? Hey, Jimbo. How are you? I'm doing great. You play the guitar? Uh, not very well. Okay. <laughs> it's more of an art piece. <laughs> Yeah, that's a uh, Fender Malibu. It's a smaller guitar, and I got bigger hands. So I attempted to learn. I need to get a different one, but uh, I think it looks cool on the wall. So that's where it is. So tell me a bit about yourself. Sure. One, thank you for having me on your show. It's great to meet you. A little bit about me. I grew up, was born in Chicago, but grew up in the Lake Tahoe area and then moved back here. My parents split up when I was in junior high. But as you had mentioned, I've been in the sales world for 28 years as a medical device rep. I've sold surgical equipment, open heart surgery. I've sold stuff for laparoscopy, orthopedics. And I've spent probably the last 15 years in what they call the interventional space, interventional radiology, cardiology, and electrophysiology. But the path of getting there was really pretty interesting one because I grew up under extreme adversity. So I was born misdiagnosed with MS. And uh, at about six months old, I had casts on both both of my legs, braces at different times. It wasn't until I was about five that physicians figured out I had a growth in my spine that was causing nerve damage to my left leg. And it wasn't uh, developing the same way as my right leg. And so, you know, I had it removed, but I had to undergo about six different surgeries between the ages of five and 10, countless tests, you know, going into hospitals and getting poked and prodded. And, and really, you know, it can be very scary for a kid when you're not really understanding what's happening. The fascinating part about it was, as I always say, that was probably one of my biggest fears as a child was a hospital because I associate it with pain. And uh, to then turn around <laughs> and have a career in the medical industry where I go right back into those hospitals. And now I'm actually standing by patients and, and physicians and I'm showing them how to use the equipment. It's a bit ironic, but it also kind of shows you the power of facing your fears and that when you do, growth and opportunities will come out of that. And so I don't think I'd be doing what I'm doing today if I hadn't you know, built up that resilience as a kid and and learn how to be persistent and, and just realize, hey, I'm going to get through this. And so I'm actually very grateful for having to go through that. What drives you? Mm. Well, I always have a saying, you have to have, a lot of people say, well, how do I get motivated? You know, how do I get out of bed in the morning? The, the key is really having purpose in life. Mm -hmm. So if you apply purpose to just about anything, purpose is what fuels motivation, in my opinion, what fuels drive to say, hey, this is something that I'm going to work on. This is a goal. I work out a ton at the gym. I have a purpose when I go to the gym. You know, I'm trying to build my body to a certain way. I'm trying to get to a certain fitness level. I always have some sort of purpose of going to the gym. So when I actually get there, I'm working on something. I'm not just going through the motions, which a lot of people who go to the clubs think I'm going to just get on a treadmill or a Stairmaster, or <laughs> I'm going to just go through the motions. And then they never actually end up really getting anywhere in their fitness because they didn't have really an overall purpose of why they're going. The purpose could be, hey, I want to drop 50 pounds. I want to get in the best shape of my life. So if you don't have purpose, it's pretty hard to have any kind of drive towards anything. So my purpose now is really to help other people. I really believe that what I went through as a kid <laughs> That was a gift that was given to me. I've had a deformed left leg my entire life. I've had to go, I had to live with. And you can identify as a victim because of that, that, well, this happened to me. So 
I'm not going to be able to do these things or that. Or you can say, hey, you know, no, no, no. This was given to me. I accept it. You can learn to adapt and overcome. And when you embrace what I like to call adversity, challenge, or struggle, that's where you learn things about yourself. You know, that's where you grow. That's where you get stronger. And I think that's the biggest differentiator between people who really go somewhere in life, get the things they want to get out of it, and others who just really find themselves in a state of lack or also just a state of feeling like they're stuck. So my mission in life now is to take all the things that I've gone through at this point, because I, I feel incredibly blessed. I wake up with gratitude and appreciation every day. And the more that I give back, give out seems to always come back to me. So this is probably the most important thing that I've actually ever done at this stage in my life. So I'm 50 now. And I always say that, you know, I'm more excited about the next 25 years of life versus when I was 25 and I was excited about what was ahead. So because it's just the, the level of importance. And I think there's just it's pretty obvious there's such a huge need for people who are just feeling like, well, how do I do that? You know, how do I look at what my current circumstances are right now and make a change that's going to get me to a better place? And so I put a ton of my energy. I, I still am a salesman. I still am in that medical device space. But over the last three years, I've really just put a huge focus on I write about it. I speak about it. And any chance I get just to share my story, even if it's just one on one, if you can spark something inside of someone to say, OK, mm -hmm. look at what this guy went through. Mm -hmm. I think I can do it, too. How do you communicate as a medical device salesperson? Well, I think the first thing you have to do, and this is no different than any sales job, is, you know, understand who your customer is, you know, understand who your audience is, understand how to speak, you know, the language that they speak. So medical, whether it's, you know, anatomy, procedures, but ultimately what has served me very well over doing this over a very long period of time is taking the time to understand what a person's pain point is or what issues are you facing right now? And if you can become a master at providing solutions for things, basically problems, you'll do very well in my line of work because that's ultimately what people are looking for. They're looking for solutions. Sometimes they don't even realize that they need a solution to something. So identifying what's going on, understanding what their business is and, you know, and then being able to add value by providing whether it's product or service, that I call it specialized knowledge. When you have specialized knowledge, people are going to be willing to pay for it. Do you think combining being a motivational speaker and a sales executive is an advantage in your field? Well, I think having the ability to identify with people and relate to people, you know, and I write about this a lot. I believe that we as people, regardless of the color of our skin, our gender, sexuality, whatever it is, circumstances that we all, we all actually share a very common bond. And the bond is, is that every single one of us goes through some sort of struggle in life at times that we might face some sort of adversity. And then there's challenges. Basically, we challenge ourselves and the other ones that we just basically, the challenge chooses you. <clears throat> so you wake up one day and something changes and wow, suddenly I've got to deal with something. We all go through very similar things. <clears throat> the more you talk to people and I, I've been very, you know, you probably see it, you know, by doing this show, it's a small world. People just seem to go through very similar things, whether it's in relationships, career, you know, different types of struggles. And so I think being able to relate to people, regardless of where you're at, <clears throat> and identify and then communicate in a way where I always say that the best form of communication is never try and force somebody to think the way you think or, you know, put something on them and say, well, this is the way it has to be. 
if you just believe in what you were saying, like uh, truly and authentically, then people are going to believe you. <clears throat> so to me, it's just about being authentic, true to yourself. And if you have just this conviction inside about what you're talking about, people are going to gravitate towards that. I don't think, I always say there's a difference between power and force. I don't think you should force anything. Mm -hmm. Force is never going to be a way where you get a good outcome. True power lies in just allowing things to come to you. Mm -hmm. So if that makes sense. How are you authentic to yourself? I think you got to be able to look at yourself in the mirror and accept yourself 100% for your flaws and <laughs> things you're not so great at, but ultimately just accept all of it and just be true to yourself. Don't try to be something you're not. Just be you. I'd say that's the easiest answer I could come up with. And and uh, I think so many people are trying to be something they're not nowadays, especially with social media. I mean, it's out there all the time. You know, I'm going to take this picture of myself and make myself look a certain way, but what's really going on behind the picture? <clears throat> you know, what are you really, how are you really feeling? And I think just being really honest and open is the best way of being authentic. What was it like publishing your first book ever? So technically I started writing back in 2020 during the pandemic. And it was really just a way of I think it was such an uncertain time of confusion and you know the unknown and what's going on. And I just started writing these pieces as a way of just trying to throw something out there to uplift people, provide some inspiration, you know, some comfort. You know, we're all going through a very challenging environment. And uh, through the process of doing that, I just came up with a, you know, I came up with about 50 different pieces and my first experience of publishing a book was actually through a very small publisher and uh, they had reached out to me, were interested, was interested in my writing. And, uh, you know, my first book really wasn't what I wanted it to be. <clears throat> the writing was, but the way the book came out, it wasn't how I really imagined it. But what I appreciate about the process was just really the process itself because it was so foreign to me. I'd never even done it before. It looks like a mountain. How am I going to do that? And I got to actually experience it. Um, it was a ton of learning. I met some really amazing people along the way. Uh, I met Jack Hanfield. I met uh, other writers, people in the industry. And it gave me confidence that, you know what, I'm on a path here. You know, I'm just getting started. You know, this isn't just the you know, write one book and you're done. And I, I think the, you know, you asked what's the most challenging part. Writing it is not challenging. I actually love the creative process. The most challenging part of putting a book out nowadays is there's over 60 million books on Amazon. There's more content created every single year than there was in the past 50 years combined. So you get, you know, every year you have a million new books hitting the, the market. How do you get recognized in this ocean of material? And so I think that's probably also one of the most frustrating parts for many, many authors is that there's actually a lot of really good books that never go anywhere just because, you know, you can't just publish a book and then think, OK, it's out there. Everyone's going to buy it. It doesn't work that way. You have to be able to work on it every single day, work on promoting getting eyeballs on your work. And I think if you really believe in what you're doing, then is it challenging? Yes, but that's just part of what you got to do. So I think that's probably what most independent authors struggle with though. Are you self-published? My first book was published by a small publisher. My three book series, I did all myself. And actually I found it to be a much more I like the process of doing, I think there's more tools available available now than there ever has been for people to actually, if you want to actually put a book out, it's probably easier than it's ever been in so many ways. I just figured it out. I watched the podcast on how to do it and I was like, okay, I can do that. <laughs> you know, and it's actually, you don't realize, does it take a little bit of work? Of course, but anything does. So I, through the process of just kind of saying, yep, I'm going to do it this way. I like the idea of having control over my own work and deciding what I'm going to do with it and when. 
And that's important to me. So I want to make sure that whatever I put out, it meets a certain standard and quality. My first book, it was, you know, a good experience, but when I got it, I was like, the paper wasn't very nice. I didn't like the way the print had come out. And I was like, well, my name's on this, you know? And so if you're going to buy one of my books today, you know, many people buy Kindle version, do have an audio book out as well. Uh, but if you buy a print copy of my book, I, the paper's top rate, printing's great, everything about it. To me, it's like, I want you to feel like, hey, I bought this not only for the content inside, but you should feel good about what you get. What is your strategy to overcoming obstacles? So that's another really good question. I think the first thing is you have to change your perspective mm -hmm. on what an obstacle or let's call it a problem um, is. Mm -hmm. So if you view it strictly as obstacle barrier problem and all you focus on mm -hmm. is that you're never going to actually see beyond it. And the way to see beyond it is to realize that an obstacle, a problem, it's not really what it is. It's an opportunity. So the way I focus on overcoming them is one, I always believe, I know it in my heart, that there's something good that's going to come out of this. There's a reason why you have to face it. Obstacles are part of the process of getting to success. It's just something you're going to run into no matter what. You know, it's not always like a clear path, right? <laughs> Nothing on the road, it's cleanly paved. When we drive through the road of life, we're going to run into potholes, <laughs> twists and turns, sometimes an intersection, which way do I go? And that's just a process. If you embrace it and you realize that, hey, there's an opportunity here. How do you inspire yourself? Well, you know, you have to have, I, I will go back, we'll go back to this purpose. You have to have purpose in life. I mean, I think that's really, I always write about this and it's, I'm not, like I said, there's many people who talk about it, but I really do believe that every single one of us has a gift inside. You know, there's something that you're born with. You're a unique person. Um, there's something special about you that only you have, <laughs> you know, and, and I, I believe that about myself, that there was, there was a gift inside I was born with. And if you can discover what that is early in life, oh boy, you know, that's such a huge advantage because many people go through their entire lives. They end up in a grave. You know, they always say, Les Brown talks about this all the time. The graveyard has, is like one of the richest places on the planet because it's full of unfulfilled dreams and goals and ideas that never came to fruition. So, you know, I always think that, you know, the, the, the thing is, is that you, you, you just have to, you have to be willing to kind of do that inner work, you know, really look at yourself, you know, and so many of us, people are, we're, we're bombarded with negativity every day. It's in the media. It's all around us. There's, you know, those out there that want to divide people and, you know, the biggest thing you can do is make a shift and block out negativity. Get rid of it. You know, it does. It serves no purpose other than to ruin things. So putting yourself in a negative environment or, you know, like. So I think being able to have that awareness and then understanding that there's actual steps you can take to program your own thoughts and call it controlled thought. That's how you change your life. It's really that simple. Now, it takes work. It's not always easy. And, and I think one of the biggest reasons why is, is because we're programmed at a very young age to think quite differently. And we have so many of these things coming at us that it's very hard to change. In fact, change is one of the hardest things, if not the hardest thing, that people have to do. And so... Having that introspective, you know, self-awareness of, oh my gosh, this is what I'm doing. It's almost like an aha moment for someone who finally figures it out. 
all I'm focusing on is what I don't have. I'm focusing on my current situation. I'm focusing on, you know, I'm never going to get to here because what I'm doing now isn't going to lead there. And you're right. It won't. You have to do it the other way around. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to basically say, okay, I want to live in this place in five years and I'm going to have this kind of house and I want my income to be at this level. And it doesn't matter the how people get stuck on the how all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, how am I supposed to do that? I don't have the right kind of job right now, or I don't have the money in the bank to make that happen. And that's just focusing on what your current reality is, not what your future reality can be. And if you just do, like I said, it goes back to just doing the same thing. Yeah, you're right. You just want to, you want to go to the same job. You want to earn the same amount of money. You want to, you know, you don't want to change any of those things, then that's not going to happen. But when you open your mind up to possibilities, what's possible, you have to be willing to fail in order to learn something. The problem with failure is when you make it permanent. And many people fail and then they say, well, that's it. I give up. And then they never try again. As long as you don't stop trying and you don't repeat the same way again. <laughs> I actually, this is one of my favorite sayings. I think I came up with this, but I said, if you, if you do the same thing over and over again, that gets you bad results, you're just going to get really good at doing something the wrong way. <laughs> And, and that's ultimately what happens. You have to be willing to change. You have to be willing to take that input, make adjustments, and, uh, and just realize it's part of the process. And actually, when you really start to enjoy the process, failure can be fun. You know, it really can be because then you're like, okay, you know what? Cross that off the list. I'm one step closer now to, to, to getting this right. Very well said. A lot of... Um... A lot of good points there. So as we wrap this up, thank you again, Matthew, for being on this show. This really has been a privilege. But um, what's one piece of practical advice you could give to the audience here? I would say this. Regardless of where you're at, regardless of what your circumstances are, regardless of how bad something looks, there is always a positive strand in something that's maybe initially seen as bad. And there's two things you need to incorporate into your life. And if you do, you can make amazing changes. The first one is accountability. It's just about taking ownership for every aspect, regardless of whether it's your fault or not. It's not about the other person. It's not about, well, they did this to me or that, or this happened. The whole point of accountability is really, it's about you keeping your power versus giving your power away. When you're not accountable, you give all your power away to other people to control you. When you keep it and you take accountability for everything, that's where you can, the reason why it's important is because then you can move forward very quickly. You say, okay, this didn't work. It's on me. Got it. I apologize, or, you know, let's make an adjustment. You put it behind you and you move forward. When you stay in the past, you don't get anywhere. <clears throat> so accountability allows you to move forward quickly. Here's the other point. This to me is probably one of the biggest shifts you can make in your mind and your thinking. Things can happen in one of two ways. You can either view everything in your life and everything that happens, is it happening to you. So again, I'm a victim. This happened to me. It's not my fault. You know, you can do things like that. Or you make the shift and you say, everything that happens in my life is happening for me. And that is a completely different perspective because now what you're saying is, regardless of whether it's bad or it's good, whatever it is, you're saying, it's happening for me to get me to where I want to go. Even if it's like some huge obstacle, the reason why that's important is that it shifts you from thinking about things as problems or you're just focusing on the problem. And now you can get into a solution-based way of thinking. I actually get excited when problems get thrown at me because when I have problems coming at me, 
I know that there's an opportunity on the other side of it. And so if I can't see it right away, that's okay. I know it's there. The only way you're ever going to get good at this is you just have to try. <clears throat> just try it once. <clears throat> Instead of looking at it as happening to you, the next time something doesn't really go your way, a job loss, a relationship ended. I want you to start looking at it. This happened for me, and I wonder what the reason is, but I know it's something good. <clears throat> Excellent. And how, how can uh, we reach you? I'm an open book. I love hearing from readers. I love hearing people's stories. You can hit me up on Facebook, uh, Matthew Sagowski. Feel free to send me a message. My email is on there. And then if you're interested in my writing, all of my books are on Amazon. So The Mindset Game is an instructional guide. And there's my author page. So they're, they're all going to be under books. Um, Reveal Yourself is really, I love this book. It's so different than anything else that's out there, but all my books are on Amazon, the three book series. Assets of Inspiration is coming out August 8th. That was my first book that I actually got back and I redid it, but my books are all about inspiration, motivation. It's about helping you basically understand where you're at now and how to get to where you want to go. All right. Mr. Skagowski, thank you again for being on the show. Motivational speaker, you know, medical sales device executive. You've done it all. I would also like to thank um, all of you for watching this show. You could check us out on our Roku TV channel, on our YouTube channel. I'll see you next time. Thanks, Jimbo. I'm currently working on a passion project that I'm really excited about, but I need your help to bring it to life. We will be launching soon our very own Jimbo Paris Academy. This is going to be about aspiring creators and creating concepts. Thank you for your support. I'm sharing free bonus content to supporters. So let's make some amazing content together. our affiliate partner, LifeWork Systems, focused on helping create a better collegial environment, looking at the mental health of business workers, business employees, and overall bringing the business up. Thank you for listening to The Jimbo Parish Show. 